Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to the release of our new report, The Indispensable Domain, The Critical Role of Space in Joint All-Domain Command and Control. At the end of the Cold War, the U.S. military possessed the capabilities and capacity to dominate global military operations. However, due to three decades of budget-driven force structure divestments, this is no longer the case. Our military will be severely challenged if engaged in any near-term pure conflict. A success in any such conflict will favor the side that possesses superior battle space knowledge, makes better decisions, more effectively directs its forces, and closes kill chains faster. This is the vision of Joint All Domain Command and Control, or JADC2 for short. And space is absolutely critical to moving information at the speed, size, and relative range required to achieve this vision. So to discuss this report and its recommendations, we have with us Tim Ryan, our senior resident fellow for space power studies here at the Mitchell Institute. And we're also very fortunate to be joined by Lieutenant General Phil Garant, Deputy Chief of Space Operations, Strategy, Plans, Programs, and Requirements, and Dr. Brad Tusley, Vice President of Strategy and Technology at Raytheon Intelligence and Space. So welcome all, and thanks for joining us today. Tim, let's begin with a summary of the project in your words. And as a note to our audience, Please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A window anytime during the discussion, and we'll be ready to get to those as soon as we uh, go to audience Q&A. So with that, over to you, Tim. Great, thanks so much, sir, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you, General Garant and uh, Dr. Tasley for also being able to attend. So we'll go ahead and bring the slides up here. So you've heard us at Mitchell talk about the Air Force being the smallest, oldest, and least ready in its history. Well, you can apply those similar attributes to all the services, quite frankly. And that is what is driving the operational need to be efficient and deliberate in our actions. When faced with facts like that, you must have ways to make sure you get the right force at the right time and place while mitigating risk. And well, that's exactly what JADC2 is envisioned to do. Let's take a look at the Battle of Britain to see a classic example of how information and decision superiority can be the deciding factor in a conflict. An outnumbered RAF going against a much larger massing German Air Force utilized their radars to collect data. This was then processed into actionable information and relayed to air crews through C2 channels. Bottom line, this system allowed for the posturing of fighter aircraft at the right time and place to best defend the homeland while avoiding zones of risk. That is exactly what JADC2 is envisioned to do, the right warfighter at the right time and place to achieve a desired effect while avoiding risk. Importantly, this is not a singular program or capability. Regardless of service capabilities, space-based technologies and space force capabilities are absolutely essential for JADC2. In short, JADC2 cannot be realized without space-based transport and sensors. So how do we get here? General Deptula, you alluded to this. Force structure reductions, two decades of counterterrorism operations focused, and too many curtailed or canceled modernization programs have left the services with less capacity and capability to credibly deter, and if necessary, defeat a peer adversary. Here's an example. As you think about a conflict in the Indo-PACOM AOR, clearly bombers are gonna be important. Well, this chart up there, shows on that second line that since 1999, we've gone from 228 mission capable aircraft to 59 mission capable aircraft. Here's the reality. China is the pacing threat and is identified as such in the 2022 National Defense Strategy. If you take a look at the reductions in force structure, the reality is the DOD falls short of meeting the National Defense Strategy requirements. Warfighting success will depend upon ensuring combat assets 
are optimized and employed at the right time and place to secure the desired effects while mitigating points of vulnerability. The Indo-PACOM AOR itself creates challenges. Existing force structure already too small, given those post Cold War cuts and anemic modernization efforts will also be diluted by the expanse of the Indo-PACOM AOR. This AOR is enormous, spanning 100 million square miles or roughly 52% of the Earth's surface. This is, will require teaming for operational success, focused on movement and maneuver across vast distances and to operate from dispersed locations to be even minimally survival. And those forces will likely be separated by hundreds or thousands of miles of water. In other words, data will need to be collected, processed and moved at speed, scale and range to enable warfighters. All the while, the enemy will be doing everything in its power to disrupt these functions. So what is China's thoughts and, and their strategy and what have they been up to? Well, China's gone to school on the US war making capabilities and that has resulted in a major campaign to modernize its physical military capabilities. That's everything from building aircraft carriers and forward operating islands in the South China Sea to stealth fighter aircraft and standoff munitions. As well in their strategy, they have come up with what I call phase one and phase two, the first phase being informationizing warfare. What does that mean? Well, that represents the transition from a mechanized force designed for attrition warfare to one that could leverage the power of information, weaken an adversary's ability to acquire, transmit, process, and even use information during war and deny that advantage to the adversary. Phase two is utilizing that and then going to intelligentizing warfare. Now, this is very much like our vision of JADC2. They want to develop the C2 infrastructure and policies necessary to fight future wars where information will be the dominant form of power. In many regards, this is taking Colonel John Boyd's classic OODA loop and applying it to modern warfare across the joint force with the attributes of the information age. If you take a look at the triangle there in the corner, it's the ability of sensors, processing power, and human actors in the decision sphere to understand the battle's face. This will all be knitted together by a robust communication layer. The scale and scope of the Pacific region, paired with the nature of the Chinese threat, will demand a new generation of sensors to gather the data necessary to empower smart decision making processors to turn that data into useful decision level information to be executed by the right warfighter at the right place in time. This will all be underpinned by a resilient, robust layer to transport that data. This will include systems that can penetrate, see or sense deep behind enemy lines and provide persistent observations as well as providing the needed force protection and defense coverage outside of contested lines. Now space-based sensors will be needed to meet tomorrow's mission demands. While not all inclusive, I did focus on the most discussed examples of ground moving target indicator, GMTI, and air moving target indicator, AMTI. Now, while the air domain will still be important in this regard, data collection missions will increasingly transition to space to provide data from the entire AOR with persistence and rapid refresh rates to include contested areas. Space-based sensors also provide the advantage of disaggregating the sensor, the processor, and the C2 personnel. When you think of traditional airborne assets, they have all of those on board, and it makes the targeting for our adversaries much easier. This will require updates to CONOPS, of course, as we move these capabilities to space. Think about this. Aircraft platforms are focused on tactical battles and battle managers. As we move to space, we need to learn some of those early RPA lessons and quickly eliminate the 5,000 mile screwdriver, as well as develop the battle managers needed for this level of engagement. Now, no matter how much the DOD invests in sensors, processing power, C2 centers or frontline assets, none of this will matter without the ability of a robust, rapid and resilient space-centric communications. Just consider the critical role that the MIL-SATCOM or military satellite communication 
Backbone has provided in supporting real-time, remotely piloted aircraft in operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as around the globe. This is not a new mission for the space community, but instead builds upon decades of experience in this realm. The reality is we have disparate tactical links, things like Link 16, and we've got the services working on their pieces of JADC2. And so as you can see, this quickly can become just as disconnected as a fourth generation aircraft trying to talk to a fifth generation aircraft. The SDA will be launching a constellation of proliferated low earth or LEO orbit satellites, integrating the services tactical networks to create the transport layer, a mesh network. The SDA views this transport layer as primarily an integration problem, meaning integrating multiple service efforts into a cohesive whole. This is version one and must evolve to enabling the ability to send and receive from multiple satellites on multiple frequencies in multiple orbits to include allies, partners, and commercial. Let's be honest. We know this is important, but guess what? So do the Chinese. Obviously, shooting down a B-21 or sinking a carrier would be a very bad day for the United States, but taking out these nodes would be debilitating. As I did my research, I could not find a transport layer backup system. The sensor nodes on orbit and the space transport layer must be hardened, be deployed in a proliferated network system, and undertake system resiliency measures to include rapid reconstitution. Mission assurance will be the main objective. Additionally, robust space domain awareness, not just situational awareness, is needed. The U.S. Space Command commander calls this the command's top priority. Space domain awareness is much more than space situational awareness. Not only does this require mapping of the physical location of the objects on orbit, but the intent of the assets, both friendly and malign. Even if the Space Force is defending a well-designed JADC2 space transport layer with robust defenses and superior space domain awareness, the Space Force will still need weapon platforms to defend and defeat incoming attacks. Without a credible deterrence capability, adversaries may be willing to gamble relatively minimal blowback to attack and permanently take out the essential U.S. space-based capabilities. We do this in every domain. When someone is shooting at you, you must be able to shoot back. So I have some recommendations to enable the JADC2 vision. The first one, someone must be in charge of the integration to ensure we don't end up with a proverbial square peg for a round hole or the, some of the issues that we have with fourth generation and fifth generation aircraft not being able to communicate. Number two. This is about money and policy. Without the guidance to inform how money will be allocated, this will never be fully developed. Number three and number four kind of go together. The DOD has a role to report on how it's going to field and defend the components of JADC2. Meanwhile, Congress must fund the ability to provide the enhanced space domain awareness and to develop the weapons needed to defend it. Number five, unless the defense of the very part that underpins the success of JADC2, the transport layer, is defended, it will remain the Achilles heel and funding will not happen. Number six, that's tied to number one. We have to monitor throughout the process by having also enabling having someone in charge, again, to eliminate that square peg round hole issue. It must be reviewed frequently to keep the focus. Number seven. I think the CSO's quote sums this up best at the bottom of the page here. Space underwrites the joint force. Never forget the space force is an armed service. Number eight. The preparation of warfighters is essential for successful campaigns and is consistent with warfighters in any other domain. The first time guardians encounter an event cannot be an actual combat. There is no doubt 
This will be an expensive and complex program. But the opportunity cost of ignoring the threat and overall impact of US forces and war fighting capabilities is far greater. It is cheaper to do it right the first time and there is no second chance. We lose. Thanks, I appreciate that. And with that, General Deptula, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, well, thanks uh, very much, Tim, for that uh, overview. Those are some uh, pretty uh, bold uh, recommendations, and uh, we can talk about that in, uh, in our discussion ses session. Unfortunately, I just got the word that General Garant got pulled away for a critical event in the Pentagon. Uh, that kind of stuff happens to all of you who have, uh, who have worked there uh, before. Uh, but he will be at our first Mitchell Institute Space Forum tomorrow to talk about these subjects. But with that, Brad, let me offer you the opportunity uh, to share your perspectives uh, on this uh, very important topic uh, before we dive into more detail. So over to you, Brad. Thank you. <clears throat> thanks, General. Thanks, uh, Tim, and thanks to the Mitchell Institute for uh, kicking off the paper today, and uh, I think it's great. Uh, and look forward to being with you face to face tomorrow. I, I think from an industry standpoint, we think of a few things. Number one, uh, we're focused on on providing capabilities for the warfighter. In this case, the the joint space and air cap sets of capabilities. Um, when I think about you know what Tim just presented, which was a really a great summary of the details in that paper, uh, I, I really think of it from an industry perspective of providing capabilities in four specific ways. Number one, and, th and this has to do with how um, the combatant command, the threat environment has, has evolved over the last 15, 20 years. So number one time, um, if you think about the battles that we've had and the capabilities we've been focused on providing for the last you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, time has been a critical parameter. And how that's changing now is instead of planning and operational actions uh, evolving over you know, hours and days and, and months, uh, it's shrunken down now to where you know, space is a, is a real-time warfighting domain. The air is a real real-time warfighting demand. And so we're talking minutes and seconds at the most hours for planning and conduct. So number one, we think about JADC2, I think about time. Number two, I think about um, effects or, or at distance. So the distances that you would consider in the past for conducting tactical or operational sets of capabilities between air and the ground, I'll use that as an analogy. Um, today, they are much longer. And so what that means is when your effects are operating much longer ranges, when the threat's operating at much longer ranges, you have to have the same sets of capabilities that operate at distance. And so from the standpoint of the JADC2 framework, as Tim so aptly pointed out within the Indo-PACOM AOR, uh, the ability of our, our sets of effects or effectors and the ability of the threats have gotten much longer. And so the entire span of the battle space is now expanded. And so we have to think from an industry perspective, we have to think about what are the capabilities that we're trying to bring to bear to support the warfighter. Number three, sensing. In the past, you may have thought with just only the US Air Force, you may have thought of what are the sensing and effects that, that airborne platforms can provide. But now because these ranges are longer and the times are shorter, we have to think about advanced sensing capabilities that can be provided from space in concert with air and how they work together. Um, you know, from a joint all domain command and control, we're not talking about individual services, individual capabilities, individual domains, air and space, they're all operating together. And so we have to think from an architecture and a capability standpoint, how we do that. And, and the fourth element really is really the information flow. And so this has always been arguably the biggest challenge is, is how do you get the information needed to the, to the decision maker or the warfighter at the appropriate time and place to make the right decisions in combat or to prevent, to provide deterrence. But so, so the, as, as Tim pointed out, the ability to move that information around in real time via the transport later or some other mechanism are absolutely critical. And in the past, we did that in the air. But now when you have air and space synchronized to conduct combat and war fighting actions, you have to think about how do I get that information flowing over red black channels in real time where the sensing and effects necessary are prioritized in accordance with, with the combatant commander's intent. And so that's the last thing I would submit to you from an industry perspective that we, we think about is how do we get that information to the right place at the right time? Back to you, General. Yeah, well, thanks very much for that. Uh, so now let's dig into some of the points uh, that, that, that you all have raised in a, in a bit of more detail. Tim, uh, let me uh, throw the first question to you. 
Um, as we develop the requirements for both space transport and space sensors, uh, can you comment a bit more and discuss the importance of hardening as well as proliferation of systems and orbits uh, to that uh, series of requirements? Yes, sir. Thanks. I appreciate that question. So it, it comes down to being able to defend the transport layer, the sensor layer, to be able to proliferate them to, ch to challenge the adversary's targeting capability. Um, when you look at some of the, the things that we have on orbit today, we don't have large proliferation of most of these orbits. Um, it goes back to some of the uh, discussion coming into the establishment of the Space Force with General Hyten and others saying, we've got to be able to maneuver away from having these large targets uh, out there that are easily, uh, number one, easily targetable, but number two, again, taking out one or two of something now eliminates the capability. Taking the proliferation uh, look, which SDA is doing, uh, as I talk about, um, with the transport layer that they're putting up, I think that that's version one. So you have that transport layer that if you take out one or two pieces of that, you still have the ability to be able to communicate, um, as well as within that transport layer, having cross links so that they don't have to come to the ground uh, enables that. So, so that you start to get to the stage of looking at how you do uh, orbit design or force design, which falls onto the CSO's responsibility. Um, as we go forward, we must be able to have that proliferation to, to challenge the, the adversary, uh, their targeting capability. Okay, great. Brad, you want to weigh in on how industry thinks about these kinds of uh, options? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. No, I, I think from a standpoint of survivability of space-based systems, um, I think about it in terms of uh, disaggregation and distribution. I think that was the fundamental thrust of the where the space development agency is going. That's where, you know, chief space operations, they've talked about reducing the number of, of quote-unquote juicy targets. I think the point is that um, when you have a large number or potentially large number of unmanned assets, which is what space is fundamentally all about, you can start thinking about how do I distri distribute, disaggregate, um, think about systems, systems architectures, thinks about nesting different capabilities, whether that's commercial, civil, military, all combined. I mean, the trades in a system, systems architecture that you can do to provide resilience um, it just offers you a lot more options in space than maybe we had thought about in the past. And the other thing I'll point out is with the rapid drop in the cost of launch per pound, it has fundamentally changed the architecture of how we can think about these system systems approaches to defend against kinetic or non-kinetic threats. Okay, good. Let me toss another one to you, uh, Brad. Uh, Tim identifies it. Not only will space provide the transport layer, but it's also going to contain space-based sensors. He specifically looked at the ground moving target indicator or GMTI and air moving target indicator AMTI. Uh, both are currently traditional airborne capabilities. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how space-based uh, moving target indications, whether they be looking at air or ground might look and the advantages of operating these capabilities from space? Sure, I, I think from the standpoint of the capabilities that we should definitely think about, I, I think you can think about AMTI and GMTI in space no different than we did in the air domain for the last 50 or 60 years. And, and like I said, that's why I brought up earlier the point about range. Um, when I need to look over the horizon compared to what an airborne platform might be able to provide, because I have to be able to sense at the distance to provide the effects I need to accomplish the mission, then it makes perfect sense that we should consider AMTI and GMTI from space, because now that can potentially, you know, within a resilient framework, that can provide me the capability to do the long range sensing over the horizon about, about wherever the threats may be. And once again, coming back to the combatant commander, giving them the options to accomplish the mission necessary. So no, I definitely think it's something we need to consider. Oh, very good. For both of you, um, are you concerned that with JADC2, warfighters might have so much data that mm -hmm. it's going to hinder instead of enhance their decision making. And how might this challenge be mitigated? 
Yes, sir. I, I think that when you take a look, you're right. It's a massive amount of data or information um, as it's processed. So what you need to be able to do, and I, and I think that, that sometimes this gets lost in JADC2 um, uh, discussions, it is not being able to take all of the data all of the time and give it to all the warfighters. It's taking the right data at the right time to the right warfighter so that we can enable an effect. Um, now, that can be done in several different ways. You can do that um, either through filters on the weapon systems, um, uh, again, akin to the way that pilots today can filter the data coming into the, into the cockpit uh, to utilize what they need. Uh, you can utilize this through um, AI and machine learning as we go forward to be able to, to, to use algorithms as the data is coming in to be able to filter things out. You might also be able to, to program that in uh, um, uh, and, and be able to plan out that as well. Uh, the other piece that I think that needs to be looked at is especially from not looking at it from a tactical shooter perspective, but also when you, when you take that back to the C2 level, clear guidance needs to be established um, so that you don't have the, the a chaos reaching into a cockpit or you don't have the NMCC, quite frankly, reaching into a chaos, right? You got to be able to have that because now all of these different levels from the shooter all the way back to the highest levels of command and control are going to have access to this information. We cannot allow that creep to start to, to go where we have multiple people. Cockpits only have one or two seats in it for a reason. We don't want to be able to, to, to give more to that. And I think that those are some of the left and rights that we'll have to look on that. Yeah, let me jump in there. I mean, this is one of the primary reasons that your first recommendation uh, needs to be uh, accepted, if you will. I mean, there has to be uh, a belly button at a high enough and significant uh, location in terms of organization inside the Department of Defense to be able to lay out and direct the architecture. Not how to tell each service how to choke chickens in the design, but particularly this example where, okay, how are you going to allocate uh, the information to the appropriate warfighters in the appropriate space? That's a huge challenge. Uh, and it can't be left up to uh, uh, everybody to come up with their ideas. Brad, do you want to talk a bit about how industry is looking at this challenge? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll talk about it in two frames of reference. One is I always, even though I'm a technologist, like coming back and talking about history. And then the second, I'll talk about where's technology today and why does that provide us options to work this problem today? So history, the last 20, 25 years, I'll never forget the term that was that was brought up during the global war on terror. We're, we're, we're drowning in information or drowning in data and star for information. And that was, yes, it's general. <laughs> that was all about, you know, the quantity of full motion video feeds on a remotely piloted or unmanned assets. And we generated so much information that, you know, we drowned the warfighter in trying to analyze the information coming. And they were struggling for a good 10 years, figuring out how from an architecture and a sensor and a capability standpoint, we're we gonna do it. So we've been down this path before. We know that we can in fact generate so much information that we drown the warfighter and we've got to work on that. So from an industry perspective, what are the technologies and the capabilities that we can use to help solve the problem? Well, in addition to my comment earlier about launch, the cost of launch coming down, um, I, I would, I'll put to commercial industry, the rise of the graphical processing unit, the GPU in the late 2008, 9, 10, really ushered in the, the, the growth of the cloud, but it also means between that and the cost of launch coming down, this means now we can start thinking about how much advanced processing can we put up in space or in forward airborne assets to ring through the information and, and the sensing data that we're gonna generate from all of these distributed disaggregated platforms. And I really think from that standpoint, whether you think of you know, the first, second, third generation of, of machine learning, or you think about artificial intelligence, machine learning, the fact is we're gonna be able to put more processing capability per pound on, on orbit and in the air and on the forward edge of the battle space to, to sort through a lot of the information, you know, to sort through the wheat from the chaff. You know, if, as the general knows from 
you know, 98 to 99 percent of the information that came off of the FMD feeds was useless. But it was figuring out where's that one percent that I really need. And I think in space, the AI ML, the processing capability that, that we're coming up with now is going to allow us to sort through that data. And we just got to attack the problem. That's great to hear you say that, Brad, um, because we, you know, we have to invert the paradigm yeah. uh, where we used to send every bit of data down to the ground. Uh, and then, you know, they'd pull out those hard drives and they'd spend a week analyzing the data uh, to extract the golden nuggets, where in fact, uh, processing capability, as you relate, is such that, you know, weed all that crap out and just send down what's of interest. Yes. Uh, now, it's not that easy, but in concept, um, that's what we ought to be, uh, be aiming this architecture to do. So, Tim, can you discuss a bit the operational differences between today's uh, military satellite communications capabilities and just what a transport layer, layer would provide? Yeah, no, that's clearly we have a... a, a a robust MILSATCOM capability today. However, the, the, the Cold War era capabilities and designs, quite frankly, it, it looks at things from um, on the protected side of, of MILSATCOM, that's your, your nuclear command and control, that's your communications between the national command authorities. Um, they do that wonderfully all day long, every day, but it's a no fail mission because it's dealing with that NC3 backbone. Um, and that's what the focus is on those particular si uh, sets of, of satellites on that side. On the wideband side, the workhorse, if you will, um, it, it's, it's got limits as well from today. It's limited today to how this scheduling happens that you get access to be able to utilize wideband. Um, it doesn't have the ability to take multiple users or in a JADC2 type world where you're talking hundreds of users uh, at one point in time. It doesn't have cross links. Um, so the, the data as it goes, if it wants to go from one satellite to another satellite, it's got to go to the ground and back up. The transport layer, again, proliferated uh, across, um, not limited by number. The has cross links to be able to get the data across. Um, so you eliminate some latency issues and concerns that you have there. And as we develop it um, through different evolutions, we've got to get to the stage, as I talked about in my presentation, the ability to take on multiple users at the same exact time over multiple frequencies, multiple uh, orbits. The MILSATCOM today, they're limited in number. Um, they only operate within the spectrum of military frequencies. When we are talking JADC2, it's not a far stretch that we want to be able to take in I don't know, commercial imagery as we're seeing it uh, unfold in front of our eyes today in, in Ukraine, you might want to be able to take and ingest that in. Current MILSATCOM doesn't have give you that, doesn't have that ability. Um, and, and quite frankly, and I alluded to it earlier, uh, when, when we talk about MILSATCOM satellites today, they are the exact example of what General Hyten was talking about in the quote unquote big juicy targets that we don't want to go um, and, and develop any any longer. So those are kind of operationally the differences um, from what we have today, which is great for what it is today, but is not going to be able to, to bridge that gap into what a JADC2 and all of the data over the, the space that we need to be able to do it over the speeds we need to do it. All right, thanks for that. Brad, you want to chime in on how technologies like uh, wideband arrays or others allow for multi-user and multi-waveforms? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think I think Tim got it at the, you know, the MILSATCOM big juicy target situation. I think in the future, we're going to see a hybrid architecture unfold. You're always going to have some larger, extremely protected assets. And I think you're going to see, whether it's pure military, commercial or hybrid, you're going to see this distribution and low earth orbit, medium or medium earth orbit for other sets of capabilities like the transport layer. From a technology perspective, I think what's enabling all this is there's a few things. Number one, uh, wide band arrays. Number two, electrically scanned antennas, which allow you based on the, the orbit mechanics to, to get the information to close the links with assets that are either up down, you know, to terrestrial, to, to aircraft or to other spacecraft, which is also gonna be necessary as part of a resilient architecture. You know, a resilient architecture is not only from the threats, 
in this particular case of like the transport layer, it's also from the perspective of how am I resilient to move the data around the transport layer in the way I need to support the combat activity or the training activity. It's not simply that. If you understand how commercial providers with terrestrial networks allocate traffic flow based on prioritization, quality of service, economics, everything, they do this already. So from a technology perspective, you can imagine the wideband arrays, you can imagine optical inter satellite links, you can, you can imagine red black mesh networkings, red, red black mesh networks operating simultaneously. You can imagine quality of service being determined in real time, in second by second, minute by minute, as a function of you know, the military action or training, as a function of the prioritization, as a function of the information necessary to being flowed around. But the bottom line is when you have a distributed system like that with these technical capabilities, it's gonna be a more complex architecture but that's what's going to be necessary to support the JADC2 implementation. Oh, thanks for that, Brad. Uh, let's switch gears just a little bit. Um, just like any other domain, awareness is uh, crucial to attaining and maintaining superiority. Um, so let's chat a bit about and get both your perspectives uh, as seeing space domain awareness in not only maintaining space superiority, but enabling the defense of critical space capabilities and how this has evolved from what's known today as space situational awareness. I know this is a bit of, a, of an esoteric topic um, for those outside the space community, but I think it's an important one and be interested in hearing your views. Uh, uh, Tim, you wanna go first? Yeah, no, thanks, I appreciate that. And I, and I talk about it a little bit in the presentation. Space domain awareness is so, much more uh, um, than the situational awareness that we have today. The, the we talk about the from a space situational awareness. We're we always talk about the catalog, and you, and you've heard space leaders come out and say how many things they're tracking um, on orbit, and and every time that that the Russians or the Chinese do a, a destructive ASAT uh, test, how much more things and and pieces that they're having to track, and that's all they're doing. They're tracking it. Um, nothing more cataloging, cataloging it, moving. When we talk about space domain awareness, and this is where the development of space intelligence professionals um, is so Im imperative. Now you're taking not only the, the, the thing in on orbit, cataloging where it's at, but you need to have a deeper understanding of what is its intent? What is it doing? What is its capabilities? Um, and, and being able to monitor that, not just from a, yep, here it comes again, here it comes again, but it's moving. Why is it moving? What is it doing? Um, and, and that's where the intelligence ties into the operations. Um, and that really gets you space domain awareness, just like we do air domain awareness. We know what's in that domain, what their intent is and, and what their capabilities are that underpins the ability to be able to get superiority for uh, the U.S. In, in that domain. And I think that that's what we need to be able to get to in space domain. That's going to require to be able to have the ability to have more things on the ground, but more importantly, having assets on orbit that are able to enable that decision making and that intelligence process to happen. Once we're able to do that, now we can start to look at what weapon do we need? What capabilities do we need to be able to go after and defend against those things uh, on orbit? Brad? Yeah, no, that's great discussion. I, I loved how General Tool introduced it in terms of, is, is this an esoteric topic? I, I remember the last 20 years really talking about this. I'll, I'll draw an analogy to the, to what, uh, you know, I'm a former Army guy, but what a, a former Navy officer told me, he said, yeah, Brad, space is really more like the deep undersea. I'm like, huh? Like, yeah, because it, they're difficult places, difficult environment. They're not a lot of humans. Understanding the problem is more complex. What the adversary can do is more complex. And, and the way I think about SSA versus SDA is pretty simply when space was the ultimate high ground and it was pristine and nobody touched it, all we really cared about was understanding the situation. So we could monitor things and sit back and take hours and days and weeks and months to think about it because it was just pristine and left alone. Well, guess what? Our adversaries don't view it the same way. They decided that they want to make it into a war fighting domain. And I notice they use the word domain. And in a warfighting domain, you've got to have domain awareness. I think this is exactly why we changed from SSA to SDA. 
um, because we have to have full understanding of what's going on in this war fighting domain to make effective decisions in real time. I think that to me is just at the core of what's going on. And like Tim said, we've got to think about what are the assets that we have on the ground to monitor in space and, and understand the awareness. What are the assets we have in space? All orbits, all regimes, all different types, um, kinetic and non-kinetic. You know, we have to understand all of this to, to provide effective capabilities back to JADC2 within the framework of, of a space air com combined battle. Oh, very good, Brad. It kind of puts it into, into language that uh, 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 John Q public might be able to understand. I don't know, that's a whole nother discussion area, but one on our educational system. But um, before we go to the audience uh, questions, let me ask you all uh, one more. Um, it's one thing to talk about uh, the space systems that we need, uh, but it's equally important to discuss the Guardian training that's needed to give them the edge. Uh, Tim, you discuss the need for simulators and a space range so that our Guardians don't encounter an event the first time in combat. Uh, could you address a little bit how these systems uh, or how these capabilities are being built into the uh, the, the space enterprise. I mean, I know this is really one for General Garant, but um, you've got some insights on this too. So what are your perspectives here? Yeah, no, thanks, sir. Here, here's the reality today. The training capability, the simulators today that Guardians are utilizing are the same type of simulators and, and in many situations, the exact same simulators that I utilized as a young captain um, many, many years ago. They were wonderful at that point in time for a benign environment that we were more or less just taking care of the satellites, making sure that the capabilities were there. They don't have the capability to be able to show our guardians a thinking adversary, be able to, to allow them to be able to make mistakes in a training environment, in a simulated environment, um, so that they are not seeing it as you had alluded to the first time in combat. Likewise, they don't have the ability today to be able to uh, practice, refine and hone in the tactics, techniques and procedures that are gonna be needed to go against a thinking adversary in space. Um, so it's imperative that we, as we go forward and we start to talk about fun, these different pieces and parts as we take on and we're putting the transport layer up and, and now that's a space force responsibility to be able to uh, operate. We need to be able to, to think and look at the tail that's often overlooked of funding the proper simulator and trainer and the, the proper range capabilities that these guardians are gonna need to be able to actually transition from the, the service provider mentality that quite frankly I grew up in to a ethos of war fighting creating war of fighting effects on orbit um, and, and that that's going to be imperative for them to be able to go forward okay very good well we've uh, there's a lot more to discuss but what I'd like to do is hear what's on the audience's mind uh, so as a reminder to uh, uh, folks in the audience you can participate by using the raise hand function on the app, um, or you can send in uh, uh, questions. Um, and when I do call on you, if you elect to uh, ask a question in person, please unmute your mic and uh, state your name and affiliation. Um, and while I'm giving you a chance to raise your hands, let's go to what the texts have been sent in. Here's the first one uh, from Cal Michaels. It is an eye-opening point made by the paper that the race to transform the Department of Defense to JADC2 has it as its center of gravity space capabilities. And this substantially could increase the vulnerabilities of US warfighting capabilities. Is the Space Force being sized and postured beginning in the next fight up to no kidding be ready to defend the space infrastructure? Tim? Yep, no. That's a wonderful question. And, and it really does get to, to the heart of the issue. Um, the Space Force was designed to be very small. Um, that right from the inception, that was the design. However, as we start to look at 
uh, the space transport layer underpinning the Department of Defense's JADC2 capabilities and vision, um, I think we need to seriously look at what is the Space Force we need. Um, I, as you look at the FIDEP, you don't see that connective tissue over the next five years to be able to say, here are the not only the pieces and parts that we will need to be able to get there, but the people that will be needed to be able to get there. Um, so I think that this is an imperative for the Space Force and the DOD to be able to take a look at today and, and look at and plan out and from a programming perspective of not only what will they need from capabilities and things on orbit, but in, in concert with, they need to be able to take a look at how many people do we need? What does this look like from an operations perspective and an operator perspective? Um, because again, you know, the, the, the old saying of how do you make a operator that's got 10 years experience? Well, you get an operator with 10 years of experience. And so we need to look at that today uh, because we won't have the opportunity in five or 10 years to be able to, to all of a sudden bolt that on. Thanks, sir. Um, yeah, here's a follow on to that one. Uh, it's from John Klein, Arizona State University. Tim suggests that the Space Force really needs to consider the imbalance of counter space efforts between China and the United States. The Space Force certainly can't afford to wait 20 years to build and develop the human resources needed to rapidly expand to address the threat. Is the Space Force thinking about new accession possibilities? Yeah, again, that's, that's a great insight. Um, and that is part of the argument that, that we absolutely make in this paper. Um, and that is, we have to do that today. Because number one, as we have seen, we've got history to be able to look back upon this. None of these things happen overnight. None of these things get to go from idea to capability, operational capability overnight. So we need to start looking at that now. There is a parity within the way that the Chinese um, develop and, and, and bring things on and what they have to what we have. However, you know, when, when we take a look at the administration has come out and said, listen, we do not support um, kinetic ASAT testing that is debris creating. That's fine. You can, we need to explore the norms in, in space and, and that's all fine and good. However, just like we don't do nuclear underground testing anymore today, that does not mean we do not have nuclear weapons on alert today as a deterrence to our adversary. While we may say that we don't want to, and, and, and we stand behind not doing kinetic debris creating testing, that does not mean that we should not have that capability um, as we go forward. And that's just one example of, of how we need to be able to lay out that, that um, way forward today. So thanks, John. Yeah. Nicely put. Um, I see that uh, Teresa Hitchens has raised her hand. Teresa, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you for doing this. I'm Teresa Hitchens with Breaking Defense. I had a question. Um, several times you mentioned multi-orbit um, architectures. So I just want to clarify, you are suggesting then that there should be transport layer satellites in other orbits besides LEO. Is that what you're saying? So yeah, Teresa, great questions and, and, and thanks so much for joining us today. Um, so not only as we evolve the transport layer, could we see a scenario where we've got that in, in different orbits, but also what I was talking about there is when you start to talk about the sensing capabilities um, and meaning that you know the pieces and parts that we would ingest into the transport layer, Mm. Um, quite frankly, probably will be um, multi-orbit and on different orbits. So we have to have the capability to be able to transport that the data, receive that data um, from multi-orbit. Um, now, as we start to evolve the space transport layer, and we and we see that, does that mean that we have to also put things the transport layer on, on other orbits? I don't think we we should eliminate that as a, as a capability or, or an option as we go forward. But more or less, we have to be able to open up and say, all right, we're taking in data from, from multi-orbits. Okay, that data. makes sense. But you did say, you did mention that the 
transport layer satellites, we don't really have a backup for them plan or a plan to, and so I was trying to think about, well, how do you have a backup plan? Do you do this with blimps or in the air instead of at, in space? Or um, what do you just, you know, make the constellation bigger? Um, I was trying to figure out how you might back up the transport layer satellites. Uh, one option might be to put them in a different orbit, but then you change the latency issue and there's a whole bunch of other things that go with it. So, um, so I was just trying to brainstorm in my own head about how you do that. Do you have thoughts? Tim, you want me to jump in, help out here? Go, go ahead, Brad. Yeah, yeah, no, I, Teresa's a great question. So I love this question. Um, I think there's two ways of thinking about it from the standpoint of the different orbits. The reason for multiple orbits is just purely physics. Right. The standpoint of the technology, the standpoint of, of how you're trying to provide the crosslinks or the downlinks for distributed networks, you can do that, <clears throat> excuse me, you can do that in different ways between Geo, Mio, and Leo. You know, right now, obviously, SDA is heavily focused on transport layer in Leo. That's great. I'm simply saying from a physics perspective, you can you can leverage capabilities across all the orbits. And I think that's the right thing to do. Second, second, from a backup standpoint, there's going to be a huge amount of commercial capability that's that has been launched, is being launched, and is going to be launched. And so I think an aspect of what might be considered backup is going to be how the department, how military, how you know uh, different industry provide capability from the commercial sector that can be used when it's necessary. Thank you. Okay, we've got some awesome mm -hmm. questions here. Um, speaking of commercial capability, here's one from uh, Mike uh, Sinisi. How do you see the services leveraging commercial capabilities like the Ukrainians are using Spacelink for their command and control? I was part of the staff in the 90s that helped design those big, fat, juicy targets. The need for speed and alacrity seems to be fundamental to success. Yeah, no, great question. And, and thank you for uh, your service and, and help in building the, the assets and capabilities that we have today. Um, as we go forward, I think that the commercial is going to play a, a, a pivotal role. Now, I don't know that we'll necessarily start to see, um, you know, the, the use of Starlink as as he alluded to in his question that we see in in the Ukraine uh, today. However, pieces that do translate very, very well from lessons that we're seeing in Ukraine is the use of commercial imagery. Um, the use of commercial SATCOM, which Brad kind of alluded to in, in his last answer, is being able to have the, the robustness of not only ingesting that data in, um, in particular when we talk about imagery, but also being able to utilize the commercial capabilities that are out there um, as additional uh, capacity and, and, and being able to maneuver and, and give the resiliency that the transport layer in particular would, would need on that. Brad, I don't know if you have anything to add on that as far as what you're seeing from the industry side. No, no, I, I agree with you, Tim. It's, uh, you know, just, I just keep coming back to the cost per pound, you know, and the, and the I, don't, I don't mean to denigrate by calling it a big, fat, juicy target, because I'll, I'll be a little specific from a physics standpoint. Sometimes you need big, big, big things in space because physics dictates the size for the aperture, period, just the way it is. Um, so the, we're always going to have big things in space. The way I frame it in my mind is because the cost of launch has come down so much in the last 10 to 15 years, it has changed how everybody thinks about space. The adversary, commercial, the department, the intelligence community, everybody's thinking about it differently. And so it gives you all kinds of trades in a way that 10 or 20 years ago, you simply didn't have because the cost of launch was much higher. It's just economic. So from the standpoint of, of capabilities, this gives us the opportunity to trade large and small, disaggregated and specific, um, commercial and military, and how you work it all together. To the Starlink thing, though, and this kind of goes to Teresa's question, if we're going to use commercial capabilities as a backup, those commercial capabilities, because the in this case, commercial and a military capability are intertwined in orbit, orbital mechanics, all of a sudden, those commercial capabilities may in fact become targets. That's, that's just gonna be a factor of reality. But yeah, no, I, I think uh, I think the cost of launch dropping has given us all these different trades and and things to think about. And I think on that, if if I may, sir, you know, Brad, when you when you talk about the the 
cost of launch dropping. And you're absolutely correct. Yeah. The other piece that the Space Force needs to start to develop is what does rapid reconstitution then look like um, to also be able to give that resiliency piece of it? Um, again, the the thought process that there is some barn somewhere that just has satellites sitting in it and we roll those out as we need them yeah. uh, it just is 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 not a, a a a theory that is rooted in in reality what we need to be able to kind of get to is as we are rolling off a a satellite capability right and again by making them smaller and, and things like that that actually helps in the in the development of that at the same time we're rolling off the the ability to be able to put it on orbit, we make those and they go. That's more of what rapid reconstitution needs to be um, identified as and, and start to be parsed out of what is that going to look like as well. So thanks, sir. Okay, here's one that uh, is right up my alley in terms of interest and it's asked by Ronald Bitten. Quote, as someone who lived the challenge of critical ops intel integration, for space counter space immediately following 9-11 and the military response that followed as part as the US Spacecom Sto cell. The biggest challenge we had was the ability to access and use Intel community data near real time. Mm -hmm. This was not a tech solution challenge as much as it was a policy challenge. Is anyone looking at how to create better, more seamless, less parochial data sharing between Title 10 and Title 50 while still protecting sources and methods? Ron, I lived that life too. And as both a former member of the Intel community and the director of the Combined Air and Space Operations Center during Operation Enduring Freedom, it drove me nuts that we couldn't access in the time necessary the information that we knew that was out there and that was being held by the intelligence community. So it was like mana from heaven when Global Hawks first showed up at, um, uh, Aldafra, uh, because we, the operators, the warfighters, finally had control of an ISR asset. But back to your question, is anyone looking at how to create a better, more seamless, less parochial data sharing mechanism? Yeah, that was part of the reasons for standing up the Space Force in the first place. But is NRO part of the Space Force? No. Why? Because of parochial issues between the intel community and the operators so over to you tim or brad to add to my uh comments here i'll generally jump in so it <laughs> general really highlighted it great i i'll just add to this it's a complex situation it is not easy and the reason i frame it that way if i come back to my war fighting description in space title 10 and title 50 is mixed everywhere if you go on the ground or in the air or undersea or maritime, you can adequately geospatial, I'll put it that way, or geographically, separate Title 10 and Title 50 based on missions and roles and change of command. It's a lot more difficult in space. And because of that, Title 10 and Title 50 has been mixed. But I think it gets right to your point. We have to be able to share the information. That's why the Space Force was stood up. And I, I'll just put it this way. We still got a lot of work to do. Yeah, it's all the more reason to integrate and consolidate all of these elements yep. um, under the leadership of the chief of space operations, not to get down into the nitty gritty and micromanage what these organizations do, but to provide a common vector to make sure that at least we're all headed in the right direction and everyone who needs appropriate information gets it in a timely fashion. That kind of also takes us back to the topic of the whole JADC2 discussion. And, and that's the point here. It's not to protect, you know, stovepipes. Um, it's to share information. Um, okay, uh, Tim, you wanted to say anything? Just really quick. I think that one one piece of, of what we're seeing today that is, uh, you know, a little bit like what you were talking about when, when you started to get ISR capability at Aldoffer, you're seeing where commercial imagery in particular, that could be a driving factor for the department to really have to start um, to look at this argument uh, because the capabilities that they're bringing, um, quite frankly, are, are, are starting to come on par of that. 
So thank yeah, you. No, I, I, I t- you know, what used to be TSSCI five years ago, you now have access to if you've got a credit card and access to the Internet. Yes, sir. All right. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our block of time. Uh, we got a lot of great questions still unanswered, but thank you for participating. Um, and I'd really like to, uh, to thank uh, Brad and Tim as well, uh, first for writing the paper and Brad for being here and kind of picking up the load after General uh, Garant had to be uh, called uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, but thank you very much. And to our audience from all of us at the Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace power kind of day.